the paper I'm going to present here is essentially titled Considering the Benefits of Hosting Refugees. Okay. Uh, evidence from Refugee Camps Influencing Labor Market Activity and Economic Welfare in Rwanda. And I should say this is a joint paper with Melissa and our colleague uh, Ozge Bilgili from Utrecht University. So before anything else, I mean, we, we should take a step back and say why is this topic important? Uh, you know, motivating this study probably really isn't that necessary for the audience in this room. Uh, we all kind of know that uh, displacement now is somewhat of a topic on, high on the agenda. Uh, UNHCR, their annual update, highlight the fact that displacement continues to rise and remains at a modern day high, uh, really since record keeping began since World War II. So currently we have about 60, uh, 66,000 million displaced individuals around the world, and about a third of them are refugees. Uh, important and sometimes it gets lost in the conversation, is that, uh, but important for us to kind of always keep note of is the vast majority of these refugees move to neighboring countries, never making it anywhere near, let's say, Western Europe or North America, even though in popular media, you know, sometimes forget this. Uh, specifically, somewhere between 84 and 89 percent, depending on sources, uh, say that refugees reside in low and middle income countries, and around 35 percent in fragile states. And beyond that, the third main point of why this topic is important in general is that it seems, at least uh, depending again on your sources, that the length of displacement, uh, length of time in displacement is on the rise. Uh, so there's a need to consider not just the short-term effects of the refugee shock, but some, uh, more importantly, some of these medium to longer-term effects uh, that relate to some of the, the core development issues uh, that we're all discussing. Following up on that, I mean, I, I think this map does a pretty good job of just kind of giving a geographic idea of where displacement by and large is taking place. So this is, these are the top 10 countries of origin for refugees in the world today. Uh, this is just the statistics from the European Commission. And what we see is of the top 10, about seven of them, seven of them specifically, are located in their central or eastern Africa. Uh, so yeah, you have Congo, you have Sudan, you have uh, Somalia, uh, et cetera. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's really important that we, this is clearly just countries of origin, but to think about those regions in general, given the fact that most refugees are, are staying in those regions, to really look at the effects of displacement on those communities within those regions themselves. And in this case, obviously, we want the falls within the region of Eastern Africa. So with this paper in particular, what do we want to understand? Uh, our main research questions are twofold. First of all, how do host communities adjust labor market activity in the presence of refugees? And second, what are the consequences for the host communities in terms of that kind of welfare. To do this, we use data from an original household and community survey collected in May of last year uh, within refugee camps, three refugee camps in particular, and surrounding host communities at very, various distances through those camps. To give you a quick preview of those results, uh, on average, residing within 10 kilometers of a refugee camp leads to increased wage employment for host community members. On average, residing within 10 kilometers from a refugee camp leads to greater asset ownership for those same individuals. And females, in particular, nearby camp seem to be more likely to be self-employed. So this work really is, is speaking to a literature that isn't that long in the making uh, and isn't that deep. But there are specific people, including the likes of Isabel here and Carlos, uh, that are, are very much trying to tackle this economic support migration type of issue and, and going a little bit deeper. Uh, many of them are using this, this data set from Tanzania, from the Kagera region, but there are others as well. Um, but in general, I guess, in this literature, what we can say is that there's a consensus, by and large, that the arrival of refugees has the potential, at least, to breathe new life and dynamism into the local and regional economy. So we can say that, yes, refugees come in, there are issues with supply and demand, there are is issues with the local labor markets, there are adjustments, and there are livelihood activities that are created, there might be redistributive uh, effects that need to be taken into account, but by and large, there's something happening once the population or a significant population moves into an area. Um, the seminal paper by Chambers in 1986 really helped set the framework of how to look at some of these issues and, and frame the issue in a more nuanced way uh, regarding unequal effects in the host community. So it's not just that everyone may benefit or everyone may be hurt, but there are maybe specific parts or, or groups within that host community which might particularly benefit, take advantage of the, the benefits that are available. Uh, whereas there might be others that are, are losers when a refugee population starts to be Stemming from that paper, uh, some of the, the papers, the more empirical papers, looking at the specific objectives here, or the outcomes that we're interested in here, uh, specifically labor market and economic welfare. In terms of the labor market, you have a few papers, one of them by Isabel and, and her co-author Carlos, uh, who, who find that locals face higher competition in general from refugees in certain sectors and are less likely to be involved in ag agricultural work or casual labor. Uh, and then another paper looking at Syrian refugees around the Turkish border 
you have from Truman, uh, you have this idea that natives' informal employment declines with the presence of refugees uh, while their form formal employment rises. So again, you're seeing this kind of substitution effect once a, a population moves in with very skilled levels. Of that. And then second, in terms of economic welfare, there hasn't been as much work, I'd say, in this area. Most of it has been on the labor market effects, but there are a few, and by and large, they find that when a refugee population moves into an area, that there are positive wealth effects, uh, including specifically with regards to asset ownership and consumption. So just give you a little bit of idea of the Rwandan context in particular. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of, you know, everyone understands more or less the, the context of Rwanda and the genocide and, and their own issues of displacement. But Rwanda itself has been a country that has taken in quite a few refugees over the years. Uh, today, there are about 75,000 Congolese refugees in particular in the country, and the vast majority are in a protracted situation, meaning they've been living there for more than five years, in one of five camps. We today will specifically be looking at three camps, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Officially, and this is important for the premise of this whole entire study, is that Rwanda, the Rwandan government, does not impose restrictions on Congolese refugees regarding their rights to work, their access to education, uh, and their freedom of movement. So, in principle, the Rwandan, or the, the Congolese population, is able to leave the camp, they're able to find work, they're able to access land if, if, if possible, uh, they're able to access education. In practice, though, ha the local integration of Congolese refugees still remains quite a big obstacle, uh, in, especially in host communities. It has been a persistent challenge. Uh, and by and large, this is one of the main reasons for this. One, the limited nature of access to land. Rwanda is, is a, a highly, densely populated country, and, and the land is somewhat limited. So to, for a Congolese refugee to come in and try to buy land is, is somewhat difficult. Uh, and at the same time, the restricted nature of just the local labor market difficult for a Congolese refugee to find formal wage employment. So by and large, a lot of times, you know, some of these populations have been there since the, the early, like the mid to late 90s, uh, they've remained dependent on humanitarian aid within refugee camps. So as I mentioned, the three refugee camps that we are looking at here are Gehembe, Gehembe, and Gaziba. Uh, the year establishment is there, so just to give you an idea of how long they've been open. Basically, Kahembe is it was opened in 97, Gaziba in 96. It's important to note that the 2012 has a little asterisk against it because Yigeme originally was opened in 1995 for uh, the Burundian refugee population at that time. Uh, in 2009, that camp was decommissioned due to the Burundian population returning at that moment. But then they, the, the Rwandan government decided to reopen the camp due to a new influx of Congolese refugees uh, due to fighting in, in the North and South Kivu area around that time. In terms of the population, so you can see that the total population of these camps ranges from about 14,000 to about 19,000 individuals, so it's, it's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, more importantly, in terms of the relative population of the local host communities, uh, it ranges from about 9% to 19%. So again, you know, these aren't huge numbers, but at the same time, they're, they're not minimal uh, neither. So uh, relatively, they're, they're a significant increase in population. In terms of our research design, so here's a this is a nice little map just to give you an idea, a geographic idea of where these camps are located within the country. So this is a, yeah, just a, a map of Rwanda at the, the administrative cell level. And so we specifically surveyed within each of those three camps, Gehembe in the north, Gehembe in the south, Gaziba in the west. Uh, it's a little yellow cell in the middle of those concentric circles. In the orange areas, we randomly surveyed households. Uh, so that's within 10 kilometers of that camp. We randomly surveyed there. And then we also randomly surveyed in how, for, uh, randomly surveyed households in communities uh, beyond 20 kilometers. So in a sense, what we're trying to do here is create this counterfactual scenario where we can, able to compare, we can compare households within 10 kilometers of the camp versus households outside 10 kilometers of the camp. And I should mention that 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer decision, uh, it, it kind of stemmed from, well, it stemmed from the literature, it stemmed from discussions with other researchers who were uh, very much aware of this, this context. Uh, and also just some practical issues. I mean, basically, when we talk to people about where refugees were interacting with local, local host communities, they always said, you know, within local markets. And due to the fact that there isn't much public transportation in this context, a lot of people get around just by foot or, or possibly by bicycle, it seems like most of the interaction would be happening within a 10-kilometer area within those local markets, whereas it was less likely, much less likely for uh, refugees to be interacting uh, with the host communities outside of 20 kilometers. So following up on that, our empirical approach generally, as I said, is, is pretty straightforward. We're just going to report linear probabil probability estimates of the main variable of interest, which is uh, camp proximity. And again, this is just a dummy variable for whether the household is located within 10 kilometers versus whether the household is located 
beyond 20 kilometers from each camp. Uh, plus, we want to look a little bit or dig into some of these heterogeneous effects, so we, look, we include interaction terms to identify uh, some, some heterogeneous effects, uneven effects based on gender. We also look at camp-specific effects, and I don't think we're going to have time to get into camp-specific effects in this presentation, but it's in the paper if you're hearing. And then beyond just these baseline estimates, we also include uh, a bevy of robustness checks due to the potential for selection bias. I'm sure many of you have already been considering. So one thing is that there could have been, once these camps were established, there could have been local Rwandans who moved into these areas in anticipation of a booming local economy. Uh, to try to mitigate that, we limit our sample to only those people who were either born in, their, in the community that we're surveying or moved into that community prior to the establishment of the nearest community, or the nearest community camp. In the sense, we're, we're mitigating that uh, positive self-selection that could be taking place. Secondly, you can imagine that these camps didn't just fall down from the sky. They were placed in certain areas for specific reasons. It might affect our outcomes. Uh, in all our discussions with government officials, for example, to try to get at this why, you know, why back in the early 90s, early to mid-90s were these camps located in this specific region. Uh, the main answer that we got was there was land available. We asked why was there land available, it was just there was land available and that was, that's it. So thinking a little bit further about why might there be land available in a country that is, has such a high uh, population density and has such high restriction to the land access, uh, we, we started thinking, okay, maybe it's because that land was infertile. Or maybe it was just less desirable than other areas. Uh, that might have something to do with it. So kind of pulling on that thread and, and, and going beyond that, we're thinking about an instrument that might be able to, to proxy for agricultural, agricultural conditions. Uh, we're here using a measure for long-term precipitation, precipitation trend. And this measure uh, is based on data from NOAA. It is highly granular, so it's, it's at the, the half degree by half degree. Uh, looking at uh, long-term precipitation from 1984 to 1994, so before the establishment of those camps. Uh, and yeah, we use that as an instrument to try to understand a little bit about uh, that selection in terms of camp location. And then you might be thinking of, you know, what about the exclusion criteria and that, that precipitation might have to do with your outcomes. Well, we also checked it against the 1991 census and we find, and I can show you in the appendix, but we find no statistical significant relationship between our outcomes uh, and just and then finally, we also take the 2012 census data and try to create as, as analogous of an of a analysis as we possibly can. So as kind of similar of a setup with this, uh, uh, within 10 kilometer versus outside 20 kilometer uh, measurement uh, to see what we find there and see if basically our results uh, using our data and our sample are robust. In terms of the outcome variables that we're really interested in, again, uh, the two main ideas that we're, we really want to get out of here are labor market activity and economic welfare. In terms of labor market activity, we specifically look at primary daily activity uh, and three specific categories of it that are mutually exclusive. So uh, first, wage employment, self-employment in business, or self-employment in farming or livestock production. And then beyond that, you can imagine that many people, it's, it's something our sample is about 75%, but in, in official statistics, it's actually similar that most people in this, in this country uh, are involved in farming or livestock production in one way or another. So we went a step further and said, okay, if those people are involved in farming or livestock production as a primary daily activity, what about secondary activities? Uh, possibly, you know, if, if uh, the male-headed household is working on the farm and the female-headed household could be involved in uh, a local shop or a local trading or something that you know, could help supplement their, their weekly or monthly income. And then in terms of economic welfare, we, we focus specifically on asset ownership. We generate uh, an ownership index based on a long list of leisure items that I can also show you in the appendix if you're interested, uh, using multiple correspondent analysis. And we also look at a subjective measure of the current economic situation. And generally, this is just based on a five-point Likert scale where one is the most negative, basically the, the household finding, the household head is finding the situation very difficult, versus five where they're finding, finding it very difficult. So just to jump right into the descriptive statistics of these outcomes, uh, broken up or broken down by uh, the distance to the camp, so within 10 kilometers or outside 20 kilometers. Uh, focusing first on primary daily activity, we find that there is a, there is a difference in terms of wage employment for those individuals. Uh, it's almost individuals, I should say wage employed individuals residing within 10 kilometers of the camp are almost double to be involved in, or double the likelihood to be involved in wage employment compared to those individuals' wage employment outside 20 kilometers. Uh, there's, they're also slightly higher to be self-employed in business. 
uh, only used to do significant 10 percent level though. And obviously the difference is made up by those people outside of 20 plumbers being more likely to be involved in farming or livestock production. In terms of secondary activity, we find a, a difference in terms of self-employment and business. Uh, it's small, but it's significant. And then in terms of economic welfare, again, we find uh, a positive and significant difference uh, in terms of asset ownership uh, as well as subjective economic I won't go into different covariates that we include in our models, but I'll just highlight a few that I think probably are, are most people think of when they're thinking of doing models of these, these types. But one thing that we need to take into consideration is the distance to markets uh, that these households have. So obviously if they're interacting with refugees, how far away they are to those markets uh, is important. Uh, also the distance to the local, local city, the nearest city. So obviously a household that's closer to a secondary city with uh, a more robust local economy is going to have an effect here. And then just in general, the community population. So you can see that uh, households outside of 20 kilometers are actually are further away from the nearest market. Households outside of 20 kilometers are closer to the bigger cities, so the official, the capital of Kigali or secondary city, and the population is similar. So in terms of baseline results for primary daily activity, uh, jumping right into pretty much the, yeah, the main results, the main findings, here we find that residing within 10 kilometers of a camp uh, versus residing outside 20 kilometers, a household or an individual, a wage employed individual, is about 14% more likely to be involved in wage employment and about 7% more likely to be involved in self If we break this down by, by gender, uh, so the way to read this is, that's why it's female male here, it's, it's females within 10 kilometers versus females outside of 20 kilometers. So both females and males within 10 kilometers are more likely to be involved in more likely to be involved in wage employment, whereas in terms of self-employment, it's only females within 10 kilometers of the camp that are more likely to be involved in self-employment in business, whereas uh, there's no result in terms of men. As for secondary activity, we find no results, no significant results when it comes to wage employment uh, based on distance, but here again with self-employment, we find something happening here with you know, gender dynamics of females in particular, that females are about 9% more likely to be involved in self-employment business as a secondary. So that's, this is based on people who their primary daily activity is farming, or uh, yeah, farming or livestock. We can say that of these households that principally are involved in farming or livestock production, some of these females are taking advantage of the fact of the increased population, um, potentially trading. In terms of economic welfare, we find a positive and statistically significant uh, result in terms of asset ownership. So uh, it's tough to interpret because it's based on a, an index but we can just say it's positive and significant. Uh, and we see across both female-headed households and male-headed households, the result holds. And we find no result when it comes to that subjective measure. Right. Moving on to the robustness check. So as I mentioned, we first took a limited sample to try to, to mitigate this idea that people could be moving into these areas after the refugee population arrives. Uh, and here, if we just look at the baseline uh, figures that I just showed you compared to the, a limited sample, the results by and large hold, so it doesn't seem like there is any positive selection happening or, or affecting our results. Uh, in terms of asset ownership, similar. Uh, the, the actual estimate reduces slightly, but qualitatively there's no difference in terms of the uh, in terms of the two. Moving to the instrumental variable approach, again using a long-term trend in precipitation. Uh, focusing first on the first stage, we see that there's a negative relationship between precipitation long term over pretty much the last 10 years uh, compared to being located near a camp. So it seems like our premise, this idea that uh, camps were located in places where potentially agricultural, agricultural conditions were worse off, uh, makes sense. And then once you apply the instrument to the second stage, uh, the estimate jumps up quite high, but again, it's still qualitatively uh, positive and significant. So that's and then using the, the same setup for asset ownership, you find that the fiscal significance drops to the 10% level, uh, but again, uh, marginally fiscal significant and the actual estimate is. Okay. And then finally, using the 2012 census data, uh, we find pretty much the same results. It kind of gives us a little bit more support to, to what we're finding with our own specific sample. And then we find a positive relationship when it comes to wage employment, both for females and households. We again find a positive relationship uh, in terms of, with respect to camp proximity for self-employment as well. Uh, if you remember in the baseline results, this was only for females. Here we find it for both females and males, so there's a slight difference there, but 
Again, it's, it's pretty much supporting what we found by. And then finally, I should mention that we also conducted focus, focus group discussions to try to provide a little bit more nuance to some of these kind of bare bone estimates uh, and, and provide a little bit more interpretation. I'm, I'm just to have a couple of minutes. We're going to highlight a few. Uh, the first kind of speaks to this general effect, and one participant, uh, one respondent in the host community outside of the Hemby camp said, since the refugees arrived here, economic activities have increased, many houses were built and selling activities were multiplied, there are different market centers which were created because of the camp. So generally just it speaks to this idea that really something was happening at the local level uh, once the refugee population was in. Even further, talking to a refugee in Kaziba camp in particular, he mentioned, when we first arrived, there were no businesses, but after our arrival, there are so many types of businesses, there are schools, there are health centers, when we arrived, that's when everything started, life came, jobs were great. Again, it's just kind of supporting this idea that really the, the refugee population moving in is having an effect for us. And then finally, we don't touch it up too much in the study anymore. We, we did in the original version, but just trying to break it down into kind of the winners and the losers in the local population that there are uneven effects in different groups. One uh, responded, host community responded outside the camp that what we are aware of is that the wealthy people in the community take products to the refugees camp because refugees are hungry and they have money. Products are bought here at a low cost and taken there for sale. Wealthy people in this community are the ones who take the product. There. Uh, so again, it's, it's not that everyone, for example, may be benefiting. It's that there are certain sections of society, uh, groups of the society that are really able to take advantage of the fact uh, of these refugee population coming in. Uh, they might be just better located within the local economy. They might be more wealthy, et cetera. So, uh, so yeah, uh, we should just keep that in mind when we're talking about average effects. So just to summarize, overall, residing within 10 kilometers of refugee camp makes it more likely that individuals engaged in wage employment compared to farming or livestock production. Uh, likewise, households nearby camp have greater asset ownership in comparison to those living beyond 20 kilometers. Uh, and specifically, we find that females and males both are more likely to be wage employed relative to the same gender counterparts further away. However, females in particular uh, nearby camp are more likely to be self-employed both as primary and secondary activities. This really speaks to this kind of gender dynamic at play here that we want to take a little bit further into. And then you'll finally, just to kind of talk a little bit about why we might be finding some of these things and what implications they have. Uh, I think generally, we, we, this is speaking to the literature as well, and it's uh, something that uh, Isabella has found in her own work and others as well. But refugees compete with native workforce for the native workforce for informal agricultural activities and potentially pushing natives uh, into formal labor activities like wage employment or self employment business, depending on formal and informal. Um, but beyond that, the presence of the refugee population, just more generally, presents market opportunities, especially at the margin, in terms of small scale, small scale trading, commerce, construction, even working for a local NGO that moved in, uh, that certain members of the host population are able to take advantage of. And then finally, in terms of you know, policy implications, you know, in light of the refugee presence, and despite their minimal formal integration, it appears to be, there does appear to be a local shift away from subsistence-based agricultural activities. And this is in line, actually, with the, the Rwandan government's Vision 2020 plan. Uh, so that's something actually that they can kind of say that this is uh, is helping. And then following up on that, you know, just as a final notes, we might say, okay, considering these development-oriented uh, effects or this narrative at play, at play, it might be high time for kind of policymakers and, and well, international organizations already doing it to a certain extent to really be considering these, these, these benefits that the refugee population might be bringing to the host. And in a sense, we can try to, to set policy and minimize the potential. And I'll leave it there.